big part of my addiction was running from life, was just running from any sort of conflict, any sort of pain, and just spending all of my time and energy trying to numb that out. And over time what happened, uh, since we can't selectively numb, is uh, I numbed out the joy and the happiness and the connection and the love as well, and I just didn't have anything. And a big part of my recovery has been realizing and um, coming to appreciate, acknowledge, and respect the fact that uh, I don't get to experience one without the other. So even in the really painful times and in the losses, like I know there's gratitude to be found there. You know, I know there's a lesson to be learned. And I know that there's life still to be lived. And as a result of getting through those things, and not getting loaded and not running from them, but just facing them with courage, you know, and using the support of the people around me, uh, that I get to enjoy the beautiful things in life too, you know, and that was just not my experience when I was getting loaded, you know. I, uh, I really did spend most of my life before I even started drinking and using, uh, trying to control the world around me. Um, really uh, holding everybody in my life and everybody around me hostage to my feelings and uh, my wants. And um, I was kind, and if it didn't work, then I was cruel, you know. And uh, I think I fell into that at a very young age as a result of some things that I experienced in my childhood uh, that have nothing to do with me being an addict. A lot to do with why I started drinking, you know, uh, to numb out that pain, you know, that uh, lingered and that I carried with me, but not why I couldn't stop. You know? And I didn't realize that until I got sober. For a long time, I really used my past and the things that had happened to me uh, as an excuse for my inappropriate behavior. You know, I used it as an excuse to be abusive to the people around me uh, and to be cruel. You know, if this wouldn't have happened to me, then I wouldn't act this way. And as a result of living that way, I found myself uh, feeling very alone and miserable at 14 years old. And so I took a drink and it was like a spiritual experience. Just took all of that stuff away, you know. And I just consciously made this decision that this is something that I want to experience uh, some more, you know. And uh, I did, you know. And uh, unbeknownst to me, it had opened up a, a, a can of worms. Uh, a Pandora's box, so to speak, that uh, I just couldn't have predicted. You know, I spent 20 years chasing that first effect, right? Chasing that first drunk and that first high. You know, when people talk about it, um, because I'd bought into a lie that day that it was going to continue to do what it had done. You know, it was going to continue to take away the fear, and it was going to continue to take away the pain, and it was going to continue to take away the insecurity and fill me with that that courage, you know, and, and that confidence, which I know today to be false and erroneous, uh, just an illusion, because once the alcohol wore off, so did the courage and so did the confidence, and I was right back to being that fearful, insecure little girl, you know. Uh, and over time, as a result, because I drank and used for 20 years and my disease progressed very, very quickly. Um, a lot of people talk about crossing an imaginary line at some point in their drinking and their using, but I don't know that there was ever a line. I believe that I'm, I, I was alcoholic and addict from the gate. I drank alcoholically and I used addictively from the gate. Um, I obsessed about it constantly uh, in school, out of school. Uh, I started planning my life around it. I started using at lunch. I started using before lunch, drinking and smoking weed. And uh, almost didn't graduate and uh, didn't really seem to care. I just remember, you know, being, um, being at school one day and uh, looking at all the consequences and all the things that were happening in my life and just making a decision that I needed to cut out some extracurricular activities because it was getting in the way of my partying, you know. And uh, as it progressed, it just ceased to produce the same effect. It just ceased, it just ceased to work as well as it did the first time. So I would try new things. Um, and uh, when I was about 22 years old, I had gotten to a point where I stopped asking questions. I just wanted to be numb, you know. Um, when I wasn't 
drunk or high, I wasn't okay. I was restless, irritable, and discontent. I was full of fear. I was quick to anger. Um, I was a gossip. I judged. I was selfish. And uh, I made everything about me. And I was just miserable to be around. Um, but when I was drunk or high, I was completely different, you know. And uh, when I was 22 years old, that's when I found heroin. And it wasn't a conscious decision with heroin. It was just an absolute compulsion that I needed to experience for the rest of my life. Um, it gave me a sense of well-being that I had never experienced before because by the time I was 22, the drugs and the alcohol that I was doing had uh, stopped working, so to speak, you know. Um, I got to a point where I was pretty miserable, uh, loaded or sober. And when I found heroin, uh, it worked. And um, I had a 12-year relationship with it and it was my everything. It was my everything. Very, very quickly, unbeknownst to me, it became the number one priority in my life. And that wasn't a conscious decision. That was just something that happened. Uh, and I didn't really have a choice in the matter. I was absolutely powerless to stop it. Um, and at the time, I don't know that I wanted to, you know. Uh, but it took everything. You know, my dreams, my goals, my relationships, my self-respect and self-esteem. Uh, my self-worth. I didn't know it was happening. I didn't realize I was losing all of those things, but I was. Um, and I was okay with what was happening as long as I had heroin. And, uh, recently, I was interviewed for an article um, because uh, one of the fellowships I belong to is having their first world convention in August and um, we were discussing what it was like, what happened and what it's like now and, and the meaning of, of the convention and, and the message that we're trying to convey and the hope uh, that we're hoping uh, to spread. Um, and at the end of the article, which takes all of four minutes to read, it says that while you were reading this article, one person in America died of a heroin overdose and several others lost all hope of ever experiencing anything but their heroin addiction. And um, it just really brought me back to that hopeless place uh, and how dark that was and how alone I felt, even in a room full of people, uh, because I just wasn't capable of being present and making a connection to the people around me. I was just a slave to my addiction, and it just owned me. It was of utmost importance, and I loved the people around me, but I was so powerless that I couldn't consider them long enough to do anything different. I remember so many times my mom crying, begging me to stop. I remember so many times my friends crying, begging me to stop. I remember so many times crying while I was shooting up heroin. Uh, because I didn't want to, and I just couldn't stop. Um, and uh, this went on for about 12 years, and there was periods of homelessness. Um, I traded everything for it, including myself. Um, it just robbed me of my life and my humanity, you know. And what's so sad about that is that I didn't know what was happening. I really thought that the reason I couldn't stop is because I was just a bad person. I believed that I was choosing to put heroin first above my family, above my dreams, above my relationships, above my friends, above my goals, above my life. I believed that I was choosing to do that. And what that was was evidence that proved that I was just a bad person. And. Uh, I carried that belief around for a very, very long time um, until I got to the river source uh, back in 2007. And one of the first things that uh, somebody told me was that I wasn't a bad person trying to get good, but I was a sick person trying to get well. And um, that gave me some hope that things could change for me. Uh, 
but it still didn't make me believe in the 12 steps. <laughs> uh, the 12 steps is something that I was trying to avoid for a very, very long time. I've known people in 12 step fellowships. I've had family members in 12 step fellowships. And in my mind, 12 step fellowships uh, either A, didn't work, or if they B, did, it was because they were weak minded individuals. You know, I, I had, I, I had no idea that everything that I knew was just absolutely wrong, was just backwards, you know? And that's one thing that I'm so grateful for is that I was wrong about everything, you know? I thought that uh, strength and courage meant taking care of it yourself, figuring it out. And really, you know, uh, strength and courage means I'm willing to recognize my limitations and ask for help when I need it, you know? And, and be vulnerable and put myself out there. And uh, I thought that uh, trying to make things happen and uh, take care of things on my own meant power. And really what I've come to learn and come to experience is that admitting powerlessness is the first step in, in connecting to power, you know. Um, and so when I got here, it was a complete overhaul of my belief system a complete overhaul of my belief system, the belief system that I carried with me my entire life uh, that uh, brought me to the streets, you know, um, that brought me to a nursing home when I was 33 years old. Uh, I had uh, suffered a brain disease from smoking heroin. I, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't use a needle anymore because all the veins in my body were gone. So I started smoking it. And at the time I thought, well, this is great, you know, at least I, I, I won't get any more abscesses, you know, at least there's not as great a chance of me dying from an overdose. Um, but then one day I woke up and I was diagnosed with a brain disease uh, called toxic leukoencephalopathy, which landed me in a couple hospitals, um, detoxes, and finally a nursing home uh, at 33 years old. And I was in a wheelchair and a diaper. Um, because I could no longer take care of myself. And they nursed me back to health, and they taught me how to walk again, and they taught me how to do things for myself again. And uh, I repaid their graciousness with uh, getting loaded the minute I got out of there. And uh, that was the beginning of the end for me. You know, I ended up in another detox and I heard things for the first time. You know, I remember two people bringing a meeting in and uh, I'll never forget them. And uh, they told my story and they talked about uh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. And I really related to what it was like. And I was curious about what had happened and I could not fathom what it was like now because I was so far away from that joy and that, that sense of freedom, you know. I was still a prisoner in my mind and in my body, but it planted a seed. And when I went back out, something very magical started to happen as a result of that seed being planted uh, by those two sober members of that fellowship. And it was that it started to be uh, nourished by all the suffering uh, that my addiction continued to bring into my life. And it got bad very, 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 very quickly. And I woke up one morning and the fear of getting sober the fear of not getting sober was just greater than the fear of getting sober, finally, because it had been the complete opposite for a very, very long time. I couldn't imagine my life without drugs and alcohol in it. And uh, so I remember that morning I reached out for help, and um, as a result of being an alcoholic and an addict for 20 years, there weren't a lot of people that were uh, willing to put themselves at risk anymore. Uh, but somebody uh, gave me a ride to detox, and they uh, didn't have a bed for me. And I said, well, can you find me some place to go because I'm not going to make it, which was new because I usually said, I'll just come back later. And they took me to another detox, and they're like, Sherman, we don't have a bed for you. And I'm like, well, can you find me some place to go because I'm not going to make it on my own. And they said, well, we're just going to recommend sober living, and you've never been willing to do that before. And I'm like, give me a ride. Just tell me where to go. So they took me to a sober living and while I was there, I realized that uh, I was really, really sick and there was no way I was going to be able to stay sober 
without some help. I did not know what that help looked like. I did not know where to go. I did not know who to ask. I did not know what I needed. And I prayed. And uh, my mom showed up that day. And um, I said, uh, I know that I've lied to you about everything. And you have no reason to believe me. But if there's a part of you that can, I just believe me when I say I need some help. And I'm, and I'm ready to take it uh, on your terms, not on mine. <laughs> and so she checked me into the river source. And uh, I remember Rusty did my intake. <laughs> and he swears he didn't yell at me, but I swear he did. <laughs> and um, I think he probably just told me the truth. And it had been so long since somebody told me the truth that it felt like he was yelling because it hurt so much, you know. And, and one of the things that I learned throughout my stay here uh, from my counselor is that when he raised his voice to me and he got stern with me uh, and told me things that I didn't want to hear, it was because he needed to talk louder than my disease. Uh, and then he cared more about my life than my feelings. And um, I'm so forever grateful for that, that the people here at River Source identified something in me that I could not, a few things. A, that I was incredibly sick, and I had a really thick disease, and I lived in a lot of delusion. And my denial system was really, really strong. And that B, there was good in me. And then there was something worth saving. Um, and so they got to it and they got to telling me the truth and they told me things that I did not want to hear and I remember one of the first things they told me uh, after they threw a book at me probably just handed it to me but it felt like they threw it at me uh, was read this book and get a sponsor and I'm like but I have real problems and they said read this book and get a sponsor and I said but I'm homeless you know, and they said, get a sponsor and work the steps. I'm like, but I'm miserable. And they said, then pray. I said, but I don't believe in God. And they said, do it anyway. Uh, because they knew something I didn't. They knew that there wasn't anything outside of me that was going to fix this. They knew that they couldn't fix it. They knew that there wasn't a pill, that there wasn't a magic cure, that there was something wrong with my thinking, that I had a disease that centered in my mind and it tried to convince me on a daily basis that A, it didn't exist, and that B, the thing that brought me to my knees was going to be the thing that would get me up off of them again, even though the evidence and the experience in my life proved that that was simply not true. But I couldn't see it, you know. And so I took their suggestions, and I got a sponsor, and I started reading the book, and I started working the steps, and I just just started doing everything that they told me to do. Um, because what I realized is my best thinking got me here and I was not gonna fix a broken brain with a broken brain that I needed help and that that help couldn't have any conditions, that it just needed to be help, period. Help me, do this, okay. And I remember I learned to say okay and I don't know and I said that a lot. You know, and, th and that was what helped me get out of the belief that I knew what I needed to do to get sober. You know, when in the past, what I needed to do uh, to get sober actually brought on stress in my life that uh, my disease would capitalize on and convince me that I needed to get loaded to figure out. So for a very, very long time, I thought that I drank and used the way I did because my life was so unmanageable. And if I could just get it manageable again, that I wouldn't drink and use the way that I did, but every time I tried to do that, get back in school, get a job, get a new boyfriend, get a this, get a that, my head would tell me, in order to figure out how to make all of this happen, you need to get high, okay. In order to figure out how to get sober, you need to get high, okay. And so what I realized is I don't know how to get sober, let alone stay sober, that I don't drink and use because my life is unmanageable. My life is unmanageable because I have the delusion of power and control over drugs and alcohol and everything else in my life, you know? That I'm not unhappy because of the things that people are doing around me or not doing around me. That I'm unhappy 
because of the way that I react and respond to life. I forever thought I was a victim when I realized today, like, I'm absolutely a participant in this thing and I'm responsible for my well-being. I'm responsible for my happiness and my feelings. And what I know today is that if I don't stay connected to this fellowship and I don't stay connected to something so much bigger than me and I don't stay connected to this solution and I don't stay connected to my foundation, then I'm going to lose all of that. Then I'm just going to lose all of that because I know what life was like when I was trying to run the show. And I know what life became when I just started taking suggestions. Uh, and my life just got really good, you know? Um, and today it's just like the little things. I was driving to work this morning and I was just observing traffic around me, you know, and just weaving and bobbing and weaving and bobbing and honking and cutting people off. And uh, it just brought me so much joy and so much happiness to just be present and observe that and just let people go in front, let people be in a hurry, not try to control things, not try to fight with people, not try to create conflict, not try to be right, but just let people be where they're at without judgment, you know? And I love that this program's given me the ability to do that in my daily life because as a result of not trying to be right all the time and not trying to force people to do what I want them to do, but just loving them enough to let them be where they're at, you know? As a result of that, like I get to connect to the world around me, you know? And I get to be a part of amazing things in my life. I get to work with other addicts and alcoholics on a daily basis. I've worked at River Source now for almost seven years. And I've consistently shown up and done what they've asked me to do and asked for help when I need it. And displayed integrity in a way where I do what I say and I say what I do and I speak my truth and I respect other people's. And as a result of that, I've been consistently recognized in my efforts and been brought to a place where now all I do on a daily basis is just work with other addicts and alcoholics. Just sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk about what it was like, right? What can happen for them? What we need to do in order to get them to a place where they can experience the joy and they can experience the happiness and they can reconnect to the world around them and they can reconnect to their family and their friends and they can be a part of life again and then watch them go through that process and the light come back on and the laughter come back and the weight disappear and they just get a levity and a lightness and their spirit comes alive and it's from the inside out. You know, it's, it's nothing that they add to their life. It's things that they get rid of, you know, and they get free and they get to experience a life that they never would have thought to ask for. And um, I'm just really, I'm really grateful for that today. Once I graduated from the River Source, I, I had started working on an aftercare plan with my counselor um, a few weeks before my graduation date. And um, part of my aftercare plan was going to sober living for a year. And I remember when he proposed this, I was like, well, don't most people go for 90 days? And he's like, well, you're really sick. <laughs> so you need to go for a year. Okay. <laughs> and by now, I've gotten really good at just saying okay. Because as a result of going through the steps with a sponsor and then sponsoring women through the steps because I had the opportunity to sponsor a few women while I was still in treatment and going to meetings and talking to other addicts and alcoholics, what I realized uh, again and just reinforced was that I had a head that lied to me. It wanted to convince me that now I had this time sober, I knew what I needed to do. And so I was put off when he said that I needed to go for a year, but I just said okay. And uh, I just knew that every suggestion I had taken from Rusty and, and my counselor had brought me to better things, you know. And so I knew I needed to continue to do that. And uh, so I was going to go to a sober living house for a year. And I got put on a waiting list and I called every day um, to uh, let them know that I was accountable and I was being responsible and I still wanted to come in. 
and I graduated and the bed still wasn't open so they graciously let me stay here and I remember one day I left campus to go get some coffee and I came back and they're like oh um, your sober living called and uh, they have a bed available and so I called them right back you know because I knew that I wasn't gonna make it on my own I knew that I had to do sober living I knew I needed that level of accountability you know because my disease was really really powerful and um, I called and they're like, yeah, we called you. And they said that you weren't there anymore. So we gave your bed away. Oh, and I was terrified and I was angry. And I think that uh, that, that came out in the conversation. <laughs> and so I went to, uh, to um, the owner at the time and I told him what was going on. And uh, I let him know that I would appreciate it if he called and made this right <laughs> because somebody erroneously told them that I wasn't here anymore. And so he called and he came back to me the next day and he said, they gave your bed away. They're, they don't have one right now. You're going back to the end of the waiting list. Um, and this is just how it works. And he said, don't worry, we'll work it out. <clears throat> and I remember uh, just being terrified again. By now I had learned a lot of things about myself and a lot of things about my disease and I knew that I needed that accountability and I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. So I remember he came in the next day and he said I took it to prayer meditation and I really need a house mom so how about you stay here uh, for room and board, right? You can be the house mom and I said okay, you know, I said okay and uh, that's how it started. That's how it all started here. And so I was the house mom. And then I became the office assistant. And then I started running morning groups and meditation. And then I was doing morning groups, meditation, and yoga. And then I started helping out with afternoon step work groups. And uh, slowly but surely, it just continued to evolve. And I've done everything from house mom to co-clinical director, to program manager, to finally life coach. Um, it's been quite a journey. Uh, and I remember when they added the life coach component to the River Source, they didn't have that when I was a client. It was added about a, a, a year and a half, two years after I graduated. And um, they brought in a few people, you know, and tried them out and um, it just wasn't a good fit. And I remember one day the owner, Phil, called me up and he was talking about his dilemma with uh, finding a life coach that he, really, he felt really strongly and believed in this component and he wanted to have it at the river source, but he was having a hard time finding somebody that fit the river source and the modality of the river source and the philosophy and the mission of the river source. And I said, well, I can put some feelers out. <laughs> and um, he said, I want you to do it. And I remember that day. Um, it was like the day that I was offered the job here the first time. Uh, I was just hit with such a profound sense of gratitude and awe that somebody believed in me that much that they knew could be helpful and add value uh, to the river source. And so I was just floored and I was very, very humbled. And uh, so that's what happened. And I got certified as a life coach at the Southwest Institute of the Healing Arts, which uh, through going through that process and getting that education, I realized just supported uh, the 12 steps perfectly. Yeah. It's all about um, it's all about taking personal responsibility uh, for your life. It's all about taking personal responsibility for your feelings, for your current situation. It's all about focusing on the gratitude, you know, focusing on the things that you do have and the blessings in your life, instead of getting caught up in comparisons and jealousies and the things that you don't have. Um, and it just reinforced that belief in me that, uh, that uh, you know, 
um, the universe is always setting us up for our greater good. And sometimes it might not feel like it, might, might feel like things are falling apart, but inevitably if we just get out of the way and we just let the universe do its thing, uh, things always, always fall together for our greater good. And uh, what I know today is that um, I don't always know what's best for me. I know what I want, but a lot of the times the things that I want aren't, aren't, aren't what's best for me as far as promoting my spiritual growth and my spiritual connection to the people around me uh, and my purpose in this world today. So, so when I'm not getting something I want today, I just kind of remind myself if I'm not getting it, it's because I'm not supposed to have it, you know, and that the universe has something better waiting. I remember there was a time in my, uh, in my sobriety where I had fallen back into a lot of despair and a lot of hopelessness. And I hit my knees and I was praying one day and I was just, you know, begging, just, I just need a sign, you know, that, that, uh, that I'm on the right path. And I got up off my knees and I was sitting in meditation. And while I was in meditation, I heard a text come through on my phone. And uh, ironically, it was from a River Source alumni that had gone through here um, several years prior. And it simply said, when God takes something from your hand, he's not punishing you, but merely opening them to receive something better. So if you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. Remember that the will of God will never take you where the grace of God will not protect you. And uh, it was just that evidence that I had been asking for that I was on the right path. So what I learned that day is that uh, the universe is always giving us what we need as long as our eyes are open to it and recognizing it. And that's what I get to do today for people here is I get to help them wake up uh, to the fact that uh, this world isn't a bad place. It's actually really, really good. And uh, it's not testing them. The universe isn't testing them, you know. Um, it's actually just trying to give them all the things that they need in life uh, to move forward. And it's just a joy to be a part of that today.